The serve is one of the only shots that is completely in our control. But for most of us players, it also happens to be the most difficult one to tame. And hence, we end up having the least confidence in it. It's either inconsistent all around, or maybe it's just too weak of a serve, allowing your opponents to go in and tee off on it. So that naturally brings up the question, why is the serve in tennis so dang hard? And more importantly, what can we actually do about it? So if you're asking these questions, you're in luck because I'm about to make your life a whole lot easier, or at, le at least your serve. Because we're gonna focus on the five root problems to why players struggle to learn their serve. And just as a disclaimer, we're not covering surface level stuff like how to prevent the waiter's tray or the back scratcher motion. And these tips can't just be solved in one single lesson. These are the foundational problems that if you solve, they're gonna ripple throughout the rest of your entire game. We're gonna make changes to your mindset and the overall structure behind how you develop the serve. But if you're able to solve these core challenges, then you're gonna shortcut years of trial and error that your friends or hitting partners probably went through and you're gonna be able to accelerate your own serve progress. Let's go. The first problem is the desire to constrict our muscles or to push the shot. And it's only natural, right? We're obviously trying to get the ball over the net into that tiny box that seemingly tends to shrink as the match progresses. And then combine that with the fact that we have to coordinate seven or eight stuff going on at the same exact time, of course you're gonna feel rushed and try to tighten up. So in an effort to stop trying to constantly double fault, players will do things like lower their toss, decrease the size of their swing, getting a more shallow racket drop, making contact closer to their body, or pushing their racket through contact. And you could be doing this either on purpose or it could be happening all unconsciously without you even knowing. Either way, the problem is usually a psychological one. And until we're able to make that switch, we're continuously going to be constricting our serves all for just that illusory feeling of control. And here's why. When we try to control the overall swing, we sacrifice being able to develop a relaxed, explosive swing. In contrast, top servers are thinking about pulling their racket into contact, and they're trying to create as much lag throughout their entire kinetic chain as possible. This of course starts by pushing the legs through the ground, allowing the hips to lead, and letting the trunk sling forward as the shoulder rotates back. And only at the last second do we allow that arm and shoulder to release forward creating that whip-like strike into contact. And as for control and consistency, they're getting that through controlling the spin of the ball at contact. So how do we get rid of this tendency to want to tighten up before hitting the shot? Because usually it's a protective mechanism, whether we're afraid to get injured, which is a valid reason, or we're afraid to make mistakes. The first key is to stop trying to control your overall swing and focus instead on relaxing and trusting your swing. Instead, try to let your entire racket lag. If you pull it from the butt cap and make contact high and into the court, you'll start to feel this natural release starting to occur. And from there, we can start to build more of these swing fundamentals to be able to start getting more power and control. That is, unless you solve the second challenge. All the stuff we talk about on our channel about how to execute that hip rotation, the trunk rotation, and releasing that force into the shoulder and the arm to contribute to power spin and control, and to grasp all that while still actually executing it in a real serve is really tricky. So let's say I just stepped onto the tennis court for the first time today, and you were coaching, you gave me two options. The first option was to hold the racket directly behind, just like this, toss that ball up facing the target, and just aim for the target versus to hold the racket at a diagonal, keep the body more sideways at contact, and use this shoulder rotation to drive the racket through contact. I would probably pick the former. It's just so much simpler and easier to understand. But it's not until we take a closer look at the biomechanics to see where all of this falls apart. You see, according to a study done by Dr. Bruce Elliott et al., this internal shoulder rotation motion at contact is responsible for about half of the racketed speed that you'll generate at contact. And this can only really be done by holding a continental grip, not over-rotating on your serve, and rotating and releasing the racket head up and out through contact. So whenever you find that a technique is unintuitive or hard to grasp, don't try to solve this by repping away at the same thing for hours because that's an easy way to waste a lot of time. So instead, try to break up whatever you're trying to work on into these individual isolated chunks so that basically you're making the movement so simple, so 100% fail-proof that you're telling your body exactly what to do 
and there's no wiggle room for error. And over time, we're able to turn something that's unintuitive into something that's second nature. Now to demonstrate this, let's go back to that internal shoulder rotation that we were talking about earlier. And this is perfect for you students who have that issue of feeling constricted with the grip maybe changing at the last second behind the racket and we just overall feel like we're pushing the shot instead of using our stronger muscles. If that's you, just grab your racket and try this drill out with me. First things first, just extend your palm out in front of you with the palm up to the sky like so, right in front. And then what I want you to do from here is rotate your arm, your entire arm over until your palm is facing down to the court. Now you can think of it as turning the bicep over just to make sure that you're not just doing it with the forearm. So turning your entire arm over like so. From there, grab your racket, get into that continental grip, and now you'll notice your racket strings and your palm is up. You're gonna do the same exact motion, turning it over until it's down, like so. And lastly, you can get into your serve stance and raise that arm and shoulder all the way up until you're at about your contact height and do that same exact internal shoulder rotation motion. And now you can start to see that instead of repping away the full serve motion and trying to get down this concept only to end up failing and reverting as soon as the real ball is tossed into the air, we're actually able to isolate this motion and we're able to focus on it until we get it down. And when you're able to add these little progressions, it makes the overall serve development feel more like climbing a flight of stairs instead of taking one big leap of faith and falling flat on your face. So try to use these feel-based progressions as often as possible whenever you're trying to learn these new techniques. Now, if you want a fully laid out roadmap for how exactly you can add power and control to your serve, often adding 10 to 15 miles per hour onto your serve, then you're gonna wanna join our five-day serve power challenge. Because we've jam-packed this video series with some of our best and most effective instructions and drills that have taken some of our past students to get results like this. So I'll link it in the first link in the description and the comments below, so go check it out. The third reason the serve is so hard to master is because of overgeneralized instructions. And this goes more out to tennis as a whole rather than just the serve. We already know that it's harmful to follow myths or ineffective advice, What's often not talked about is the overgeneralizations or loose analogies that's thrown around a lot in the field of tennis. Let's take, for example, combing the hair on the serve. Now, while this does smoothen out my hair and, you know, prevent me from doing the waiter's tray, biomechanically, this often leads to players using this elbow bending motion instead of the very important external shoulder rotation that's needed to generate a lot of racketed speed on the serve. And as a result, what was once an effective piece of advice becomes a mechanism that we end up using to push the ball at contact. This is why we found it way more effective in the long run to focus on setting up the arm in the proper pre-throw position and using the hip rotation to create the racket drop. Another example, let's take reaching up as high as you can at contact. Of course, this is much better than letting the ball drop and being jammed at contact. But again, reaching up excessively could lead to too much shoulder flexion at contact, which limits your ability to use this internal shoulder rotation, and it might create tightness in your hitting shoulder as well, leading to injury. So instead, we recommend to focus on releasing up into a comfortable position and using the initial trunk acceleration to allow your hitting arm to get into its natural position. So as you can see, while these different pieces of information might seem like they're similar on the surface, these nuances in the cues you focus on and the movements and feelings you're trying to achieve make a huge difference in your outcome. And that's why it's so important to work your way backwards using the proper mechanics instead of just blindly following random advice that you pick up here and there. And then from there, you can use simplified cues to build in those techniques. The fourth challenge when learning the serve is that oftentimes learning the serve is like walking a tightrope or bowling a ball straight down the alley. Basically, if you do too little or too much of one technique, you start to lose your balance and you fall. For example, lots of players have the tendency to over rotate, where their hip and their trunk rotates in too much into the net at contact. But on the other hand, what happens when you try to completely get rid of this rotation and stay sideways? You end up losing access to a huge power source, the hip and trunk rotation, and you end up resorting to arming your serves instead. So the most helpful tool you can use to gain precision when learning your serves is feedback. Of course, this can mean having a knowledgeable coach by your side, telling you whether you're doing it correct or not. But even if you don't have access to a coach, don't worry. 
you still have access to one of the most powerful tools that juniors use at elite academies and we tend to use a lot on ourselves and our students as well. And that is video feedback. Because once you're able to start seeing yourself, you gain so much more awareness over your body and what's actually going on versus what you think is going on inside of your head when that ball goes up. Which, trust me, are usually two entirely different things. So by watching yourself in different angles and in slow motion, you're able to slowly start bridging the gap between what you think you're doing and what you're actually doing. Now on top of this, one of the most effective ways that we design feedback when training our players is through progression drills. So imagine your full serves, like you're bowling down an alleyway. There's basically nothing stopping your swing from going into the gutter, aka doing too much of one thing or another. But the right drills allow us to design instant feedback into our training so that we can make fixes right away. Basically serving as bumpers, guiding our way to that strike down the middle. Say for example, you're struggling with chasing your toss around. Well here you can use the toss and catch drill and this will immediately get you the conscious feeling of whether you're tossing too far to the left, right, or forward. And from here, you can just make slight tweaks in your toss timing and motion until you get it down. So feedback allows you to basically take the emotion and the frustration out of your training. And more importantly, you'll have a 20 story view over what you need to improve on and you'll be able to make slight tweaks in your technique like you're an engineer working on a well-oiled machine. The final challenge on the serve is that there's just so much to coordinate. You basically have to execute two sides of the body, the tossing and the hitting side, both in synchronicity while performing two entirely different motions. And then of course you have to coordinate the action of your lower body launching and your upper body rotating. And I haven't come across one player on their tennis journey in my entirety of coaching who hasn't come across this challenge of juggling all of these different motions at the same time. I've seen so many players struggle with coordinating the leg drive with the upper body acceleration and they end up wasting tons of energy just jumping on their serve. Or they'll focus on their toss for almost an entire day, but as soon as the hitting arm backswing starts to enter the picture, it starts to get erratic again. Pros are coordinating all of these motions across a series of phases that Dr. Mark Kovacs broke up into eight key phases. You've got the preparation, release, loading, the caulking stage, the acceleration, contact, deceleration, and then the finish. And mind you, we have to do all of that in a matter of seconds. So with robust problems come robust solutions. The first thing we need to do is to eliminate as many things as possible. Basically anything that isn't essential to building the foundation of your serve. And this is why in my personal experience, the order or the structure of how you learn the serve is just as important as what you learn. When I was starting out learning the serve, I would waste hours on the court trying to copy Federer's exact backswing nuances and even the way he bounced the ball. Or I would see something that a pro did and try to copy it on the surface level where I ended up picking up bad habits like manufacturing this pronation on the serve. And this is another reason why getting a basic understanding of the underlying factors that go behind a pro player's serve is so crucial. It allows us to single out the most important movements and just focus on drilling those in first. And from there, we can start layering on the complexities of the serve, kind of like we're baking a cake or, or cooking, cooking a delicious lasagna. Did someone say lasagna? Yeah, we said lasagna. Let's make some lasagna. So the exact structure of our training system that we use in our 5.0 serve course is to develop the universal swing first, master the contact and toss, then we tweak the swing, add in the full kinetic chain, then personalize our serve through the backswing and stance variations. Now, whether you decide to use our approach or some other method, I highly recommend that you start using these principles and implement them into your training. So instead of just casually doing a bunch of reps hoping to eventually figure it out, break up the technique into simple movements that you can make intuitive. From there, don't just blindly follow instructions that you hear from anywhere, but start with the biomechanics so that you're able to know the ideal technique behind each shot. And finally, to simplify your training as much as possible, try taking a stepladder approach where you're stacking on each element of your serve so that you're not overwhelmed. Now, if you wanna follow a training program that makes the science of elite serving more intuitive to learn, 
then we've got just the thing for you. Introducing our brand new surf course, the 5.0 Serve. This surf course is packed with the best drills and instructions you need to take your serving to a whole nother level. And we've got transformations upon transformations to back this up. So check it out by clicking the first link in the description below, and I can't wait to see you there. And until next time, athletes, go out and train hard. I'll see you in the next video.